Hi, welcome to this Webpack 5 mini-series. This is a very unusual talk for me. I usually cover one topic in deep, but here I want to cover multiple topics. I want to give you a broader overview over this topic, so this is a concatenation over multiple smaller talks which cover one aspect of Webpack 5. It will cover how to get started with Webpack 5, what breaking changes you may expect, bigger features like persistent caching or module federation, but also smaller improvements like optimizations or other features. I hope you enjoyed watching these. So how to get started using Webpack 5? Um, so if you currently install Webpack, 5, uh, Webpack from NPM, you will get the stable version and the stable version is Webpack 4. And if you want to get the latest uh, Webpack 5 version, beta version, you want to use the next tag on NPM and install it via these commands um, from NPM. To get started uh, using Webpack 5, you may want to read the, the migration guide about Webpack 5 make migration. It contains a lot of useful information, what to do, how to prepare and um, to upgrade and what you want to install and what uh, major pain points like breaking changes or what configuration options need to be changed and also some help in general. If you want to know more, then there's this change log repo which lists a lot of useful information about details like what features has been added, what features has been changed, breaking cha all the breaking changes, all the details about little changes and changes to the defaults in the configuration, changes to the configuration um, APIs or internal changes for plugins and loaders and much information in this repo. Uh, later, we want to move this um, change log to the official documentation, but for now, it's in this temporary repo to allow us to iterate faster on this. One major break and change in Webpack 5 is that we removed a lot of deprecated things. So if you're getting deprecation messages in Webpack 4, you may want to get rid of them before upgrading to Webpack 5. We also removed um, the default polyfilling of uh, Node.js native modules by default. So if you're using modules like um, Crypto or Util or VM or uh, all these Node internal um, modules, which are usually not available on front end or on the web in general, and um, we no, no longer polyfill them by default. You can opt into polyfilling manually, but uh, we recommend to use front end first um, modules which focus on front-end um, technology and web standards and don't use, uh, don't rely on polyfills for Node.js models. We want to get uh, rid of this dependency from the front-end ecosystem to the Node ecosystem and basically front-end and Node should be se more separate uh, and we want to push into this future, in future with Webpack 5. We also upgraded the generated code standard or syntax in Webpack 5 to a higher standard and this means EA11 is no longer supported by default and if you want to still support EA11 you may want to use a configuration option to opt into the older standard of code generation which will support these um, older browsers. The idea is that Webpack 5 should live longer than these browsers and uh, so we um, implement a default that should be prepared for such a future, future where higher code standard is supported by all relevant browsers. There are a few behavior changes in Webpack 5 regarding supporting newer specs from new web specs that has been released in the meantime. Uh, for example, um, JSON modules, there is a spec now for ECMAScript integration with JSON modules and if you're used to using named exports from JSON modules, this is no longer supported in the new spec, which only supports the default export. In this case, Webpack 5 will now emit a warning if you're using the old spec and, and make you aware of that. And uh, also the WebAssembly ECMAScript integration spec has been updated or re released, which makes some behavior changes regarding WebAssembly integration into ECMAScript module standards. In Webpack 5, you are able to opt in to the, to the new spec or the old spec, and we recommend you to align your code with the new spec, which is YouTube proof. 
for plugins, if you're using plugins, you want to make sure that all your plugins are Webpack 5 compatible and you may want to upgrade all plugins to the latest version to get the support. The first feature I want to show off is persistent caching. It's also one of the biggest feature in Webpack 5. It requires, a lot, it requires a lot of internal changes and refactorings to make it work like it works. So persistent caching is like normal caching, but it's stored on the disk instead of in memory. So currently Webpack 4 only uses in memory caching to make watching incremental builds in, in watch mode very fast. And persistent caching brings a caching feature to 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 the disk and allows you to restart Webpack without a large hit in recompilation time. So to show it, um, I've prepared this little example. Um, it just uses a lot of libraries to make the build a little bit slower. And I, for preparation, I already did a development and a production build uh, before, and the development build took about 40 um, seconds, and the production build took about 80 seconds. Mm, so now when I do the same again without any change, like yarn build, like a production build, it will take um, only a factor of this time and it will restore everything from cache and builds in about four seconds. It still rechecks all the files, all the build dependencies and everything to be sure that nothing changed and then it also compare files difference is if there were modifications to the output file or they were deleted and we emit them everything so it should be safe that everything is fine. Um, the development build is usually just the same with smaller uh, bigger files because it's not, not minimized. A, bit, a little bit faster. You maybe also notice that um, we are generating very cool names automatically for for your chunks based on the modules they contain. Uh, that's one part of the development experience improvements in Webpack 5. In the production build, we generate um, IDs that kind of hashes. This is um, an optimization for long-term caching to make chunk file names change less often. Anyway, back to persistent caching. So um, I also can, I now can be able to start a development watch mode within a, f a few seconds compared to the full build, which would take 40 seconds. After starting a watch mode, I will enter the in-memory cache mode. So uh, every change from now on are uh, done in memory. So um, this will as fast as we will. So when, when we're storing from the persistent cache, we don't load any loaders, initialize any of these uh, preprocessors you need for, for your build. So if you do the f ch change for the first time, we need to boot up like bubble loader in this example and give it um, a few times to boot up and also need a few um, iterations to get to full speed when it's optimized by the JavaScript engine. So you see like a um, few seconds for, for the first try and then it, it usually gets uh, as fast as usual, like 500 milliseconds in this example. Uh, okay, and you also see that we don't store the persistent cache um, on watch mode. We only wait like a minute, uh, wait like a minute idle time until we store the, the persistent cache to don't want to inter uh, interact with your usual flow and want to keep everything fast. So if you do a production build, it will be a production build with changes done in the meantime, and it will restore the cache, update the, the compilation with the changes, and it ta takes a little bit longer than in just doing a build without change, because we now have to run the loaders, do the minimification of the changed file. But in the end, the, the build after persistent caching, even if files change or um, files are missing, will be um, a pretty stable, a pretty safe, and it will always generate valid results like, like usual. So here it, it probably takes a few more seconds to to build this, like six seconds compared to this three or to four seconds um, when I've done this the first time. Because now, um, like this 
file has to be re-minimized because I changed this file. Persistent caching is an opt-in feature, so you don't get it by default. You need to uh, enable it via some configuration you see here. So basically it's a cache option which uh, uses type file system, like file system cache, and you have to give it um, like the build dependencies. Build dependencies are things that um, define how your, your modules are or your complete compilation is built. So like Webpack version and also Webpack configuration. Webpack adds itself to the build dependencies, um, but you have to add the config file manually in this case. And so we give it a web configuration. When build dependencies change, uh, we will do a, a fresh build um, and clear the cache before. Here we also use some additional logging. Usually you won't, that, won't get any of these messages like uh, timing information about the persistent caching and so on. It would be silent and transparent and you won't, won't see it in, in any way if not from timing. Persistent caching is also usable by plugins. So plugins can use the persistent cache API to store their own data, own caching information, like uh, the minimizer is also a separate plugin, the Tesla Webpack plugin, and the Tesla Webpack plugin uses the, the Webpack 5 cache API to store their minimized results and, and caching information in general. So Webpack also added a few optimizations for, for tree shaking or other things. So the first thing is runtime logic is only injected when it's really needed. So if we bundle an empty file, you would actually get an empty file as output file. So this is really useful if you don't use all the runtime logic. So tree shaking, here is an example with basic tree shaking. On the, on the top left, uh, top right, you would see the production version of the bundle, and here we would say, say the development version of the bundle. First thing you may notice is that we starting to use error function. Yes, we generate a higher level uh, runtime code by default, but this is controllable by the ECMA version um, option. So if you disable this or it set it to um, ECMAScript version 5, we will use function instead of error functions. But we leave it in the more optimized way. So basic tree shaking works as a usual. Um, with these little pass info options, you are able to opt in to more information about tree shaking. So you see this in the, in the development bundle where all the exports are listed and if they're provided, used, and how they're renamed. The renaming has a little bit changed uh, for long-term caching. So we uh, don't generate A, B, C, D uh, by default. So, uh, instead, we generate we hash the, the name and generate a short um, identifier. This is better for, for long-term caching because they don't change it so often. So basic tree shaking still works. Apple, uh, import Apple uh, and only Apple is injected, in, is exported and all other things would be dropped by minimizer. Um, you see it, it's when modules are concatenated, it would be really, really optimized to bundle. We enabled um, deeper nesting of, of exports. So if you have an, an example where you ex re-export the module and uh, let me show the module first, it's like apple, green, banana, yellow, and strawberry red exporting. So if you re-export this module with a namespace object and re-export the namespace object and then use it with a deep path to this banana export and Webpack will still be able to handle this, generate exactly the same output code in production in development, will be able to extract this deep information from exports and also mangle all, all layers on this side. So it's, yeah, supported. And the next example is the inner graph optimization. In this case, we use some functions and import some exports, and these exports are only used in some functions. So in this case, we export the get function, which uses the f function, and the f function is using swap export, but the test export doesn't use it at all. So um, if you only use the test export, Webpack will be able to analyze it and will be able to drop the, the swap we export from the bundle. So in this case, nothing is used for module. Um, if I use get instead, it will be using swap A. So next thing we optimize is some kind of secret feature is like um, 
a tree shaking of common JS modules. I have the same module as common JS here with like assigning exports, module exports, or also defining properties on this. We have support more complex cases, but not everything is supported. So common JS is basically only supported in a kind of sometimes way. So only if it's dedicated analyzable, you basically support common JS tree shaking in, in this model. So here um, you would see that um, Webpack will drop all unused exports in CommonJS2 and Mongle exports the same way as like in ECMAScript modules. Um, it's also available to um, to require um, some some CommonJS modules and use exports from there. In this case, um, we could also optimize it to detect which exports are used. Same is available for the interop logic. If you require a ECMAScript module and only use some exports of them, this will work as usual. We also added tree shaking for JSON modules and also deep tree shaking from this. So if you only use some properties like version or some deep properties like dev dependencies webpack from this package JSON data, we will optimize the JSON and drop all unused properties, mangle all properties if they only used in statical analyzable way and basically only in, in inject the values you are really using in, in the bundle. We are also using a JSON path optimization for faster runtime execution of JSON data. And recently we added another optimization of manually magic command for, for the dynamic importing values can specify which exports are used from the dynamically imported module if you're only using Apple export or the default export then it would be possible to specify such a thing and in, at one time it will generate a bundle it, compared to generate a bundle which only ha has these exports it's not able to mangle these exports because they must be in the express object so Webpack 5 has a progress feature and also a progress profiling feature, got some update and we now um, show progress by a plugin. So if you would do a build with progress and profile enabled, it will show you live um, the current plugin it's working on and it also give you some timing information about each step and each plugin and it will be very useful to investigate your builds and see what's taking a long time in a very basic way without attaching a real profiler. So here in this case, we see the other plugin takes a lot of time, but it's expected. But you can also see for details for some internet plugins and so on. Another way to get more insight into a Webpack compilation process is the locking system. So we have a cool locking system, which can be enabled or the output of the lock can be enabled some stats option like locking the both and we'll print all the both information about them and with backpack 5 we added a lot of interlocking timing information to the lock output and so if you do something like that you will get a lot of timing information for steps within the compilation and for different plugins and so on and you could even enable debug mode for locking to get even more locking information in Webpack 5, we now expose typings from Webpack. So we generate our own typings from, from our source code and expose them as typing declarations for TypeScript. So if you're using TypeScript or just using JavaScript or Visual Studio Code or any editor that supports uh, TypeScript typings, you could add some annotations to your Webpack configuration uh, like, like this in, in like JS Docs uh, for, for JavaScript or in TypeScript. And it really give you code completion and information and descriptions for all your configuration. An example this allows me to write like experiments and get information about all the experiments like enable MJS, whatever. It also allows you to type check your configuration. And the whole system also works for plugins. If you apply the plugin, you get all API of Webpack as code completion and type validation. Webpack 5 supports advanced configuration for entry points. Here we see an example where we have two entry points like core and admin and the normal import of the modules the entry point should contain is here specified via the import property and this object allows advanced configuration like you can configure a separate file name or file name template for this 
file like the core or the core content hash or whatever. And you also can specify a separate library option and say this is imported as UMT library and other endpoints are exported as other lib library type. Maybe it's useful to specify two endpoints which export separate libraries. Another greater, uh, bigger feature is uh, the depend on feature. It allows you to specify endpoints which are loaded on the same page before the endpoint. Here, for example, with a um, core endpoint which is loaded on every page, which contains React and React DOM, like something basic, and an admin endpoint which is loaded in addition to the core endpoint on the admin page. And it could share some libraries, like it also loads React and React DOM. And in this case, you don't want uh, the admin output file to contain the React and the other libraries which I usually already contain on the page via the core page. So in this case, you can use the depend on feature and Webpack will create a parent child dependency between these empty points or these chunks. And in the end, the core endpoint will contain all the libraries and admin will only contain libraries or modules which are not already contained in the core. So in this case, it would be really small and only contain the console doc statement because libraries are already on the page via the core file. For this next example, uh, or this next feature, we assume we have a large scale application and we want to develop this application or a part of this application with separate teams. And each team should, the ability, should have the ability to deploy their work separately from the other teams. The idea is that at one time, all the work of the teams comes together and is linked together into a single monolithic application. For this module federation as new feature in Webpack 5 is Good to have. We see here we have three repos or three containers for each team, and these three parts should to come together in a in a full application, in a full single page application. This could be a mono repo, this could be separate repos, doesn't matter. So for this to use this feature, we would specify in the in the webpack configuration that we would like to use the module federation feature and here we would, in the application, we want to consume con components lib from team B and another component lib from team C. And to use them, we specify uh, all the dependencies in the remotes um, property and Webpack will make sure that every, every time we request a module from mo component lib or from another component lib, it will look it up at one time on, in a script tag that is loaded at one time at this URL. On the other hand, um, the other teams would use the same feature and would also use the module federation plugin. But in this case, they ex use exposes feature to expose modules to other teams. So here we would expose component, which uh, it is a public name component, and it, we would expose our source file component, which is a basic React component in this case. Another team uh, would do it the same way. You could also expose more properties, doesn't matter. The tricky part is um, we want to share libraries in, in this case. So we don't want each of these separate builds to load React on its own and React DOM and Lodash and data functions. For this, we use the shared feature of module federation. So in each of these compilations, we can specify which libraries of the build should be shared. In this case, we want to share React and the component lib want to share React and want to share date functions. And the, another component lib here in this case also want to share all eventual Lodash modules. Now we compile each of these applications. I did it as preparation for this. Separately compiled, each of them would generate a dist folder which has all the files generated file in it. At one time, we can now start loading these application. Yeah. And this could look like this. Everything comes together at one time, and here a component from a component from component lib, from another component, and I could also, if I use this toggle button, take a look at the code. Toggle button would uh, load some component here with React Lazy and load it on demand. So you can also load 
other components on demand like I usually do. So basically everything behaves like these are normal NPM packages, uh, but it's on one time it's linked together. So here you see this application running. It feels like a single page application. There's no special logic here to like iframes or whatever to make uh, it special in any way. It's just getting modules together in a single application at one time. And for the framework on framework level, it feels like every code is just a single application. It's also possible to load modules on, de on demand. Here I loaded some modules on the click on the button. The usual constraint with Webpack is that any on-demand loading should only take a single round trip to the server. And this is still true with module federation. It will only take a single round trip. Every files from separate modules will be loaded in parallel. For module federation, the initial page load needs an additional round trip to the server compared to a normal single build application because it has to get the information from the on the other separately built application parts and grab the information how to load this um, load the files from from this in these containers. So basically, load these container files, which are only manifest about where to load modules from this container, and then it will be able to load modules from this um, container. This example also shows a few edge cases you might run into. So here, like the application uses React 16 and the component lab uses React 15 in major version. So this is technically incompatible and by default, module federation would load both versions. So it would download React 16 and React 15 and each separate build, each application part will be provided each own version it's compatible with. But for framework components like React or Angular or other things, it's not possible to load multiple versions of the framework because it's it's not for a technical reasons it's not possible to make a React app from different React versions that would get you weird errors. So in this case, I can use the advanced configuration for the shared modules and specify that React is is a singleton um, shared module. A singleton shared module means it will only ever load a single version of this. In this case, the highest version and Instead of getting its own version, they will provide a warning that technically incompatible and yet you should look into grading your component lab. Uh, another edge case is here that we are both component libs using different versions of date, date functions. So here it's version 2.6 and another component lib is using um, 2.14. And in this case, all um, builds or application parts would agree on the highest version, which is compatible with this. So in this case, it will load um, the date function from another component lib because it's providing the highest version. Thanks for watching. Have a good day and enjoy the conference.